Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Running the Table, the podcast where we run through everything on the table in the world of sports. I'm here with Noel and Tim, and today we're going to talk about something a little bit different. We're going to be starting a new series called The Dynasty That Never Was, where we take a look at some of the what could have been dynasties of different leagues, the NFL, MLB, NBA, NHL, anything. Just look at different teams and just appreciate what they were and what they could have been. So for this first episode, we're going to take a look at the 2010 Seahawks, the Legion of Boom. Now they won one Super Bowl in 2013, defeating the Broncos in Super Bowl 48, but they never really got that close again, except for the next year where they lost to the Patriots, but they never got back to the Super Bowl. And it's a shame because this was a great team that definitely had the makings to be a dynasty. Now, Noel has been a Seattle Seahawks fan for as long as we can remember and was a fan during those Legion of Boom days. So, Noel, what do you remember about that Legion of Boom Boom team? See, that Legion of Boom, really, it's it's focused on the defense, right? I mean, today you hear a lot about Russell Wilson when it comes to the Seahawks, but at that point, he was he was new to the team, really. It was he won the Super Bowl in his second year in Seattle, I believe. Yep. Um you had stars. That was a star-studded defense. You had Richard Sherman, Cam Chancellor, Earl Thomas, Bobby Wagner, all pros across the board. Um, just an amazing defense. One of the ba- uh, greatest scoring defenses in NFL history. Uh, that's for sure. And it's just really unfortunate that they never really had the longevity to consider themselves a dynasty. Yeah, I mean, they were they were a really incredible team. I know, for instance, obviously they had that incredible um Super Bowl performance winning against the Broncos I know for sure like Noel if you can remember that time back that would have been what sixth seventh grade for us yeah, we were, um we we, 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 we were talking we were always time. talking about like the um the, the the playoffs and like going to the Super Bowl I knew for one fact I was all Broncos that year I was like bro the Broncos are gonna handle business no problem it's gonna be easy and I the was game also- starts and it was just straight annihilation. He'll be getting 43 to eight. Yeah. Well, because if you guys um, remember, that Broncos team was the offense that had shattered scoring records where Peyton Manning. Well, exactly. People were just people were just saying, oh, I mean, yeah, the, downs. the Seahawks was, defense was good, but everyone expected the, the, the Broncos to win. I was all in on the dynamic Broncos offense except, except, of the Broncos. Except for Noel. Noel predicted that his Seahawks would win, and they did. But and yeah, Seahawks like, faithful. Yeah, as you said, 43 to 8. It really got started with that first play when the snap goes over Peyton's head and the first play results in a safety. And that pretty you much knew, you knew where the game was going. That pretty much set the tone for the whole game. But they never really repeated that dominating success. It was hard. It was really hard for them to recreate that magic. And I mean, obviously that next year they still played incredibly well. And I mean Noel, I know you and I, for a fact, can remember that very night, the exact places we were sitting, the ex- some of the exact words we said. I know I even still, I think, have the picture of you moments, moments afterward that I took of you just in utter dismay. Um, no, quite quite I, literally, one of the, one of the plays that, that changed that franchise as a whole. Oh, yeah, because winning two Super Bowls in a row, I think that would have changed how they went into that next season very differently they were quite literally on the doorstep of winning back-to-back Super Bowls quite literally one yard away and Noel trust me we know this is painful for you PTSD but but we gotta ask what was that like so Super Bowl party in my basement right I see one of the greatest catches in Super Bowl history occurs. Seahawks needed to make a last minute drive to win the game. They were down by four. Yes, they were down by four. Russell Wilson throws up a bomb to Jermaine Curse, who falls in the process of the catch. He juggles it all over his body. Defenders think that it's not caught and he catches it. Gets them to about the two yard line. Marshawn Lynch, one yard rush. They're now on the one yard line. I believe it was second down. They still had timeouts, mind you. Beast Quake in the backfield, one of the greatest trucking backs of all time. Easy handoff, I guarantee you he gets the touchdown behind a great offensive line at that. 
Russell Wilson decides to pass, tosses it to Ricardo Lockett, whose route gets jumped by Malcolm Butler and gets Here, picked off. One of the interesting things for me is like, and I never did a whole lot of specific like research into like interviews or what they said about it. Do we know who's, was it Wilson's decision or was it Carroll's decision to go with the pass on that play? And there was a lot, lot of discussion about that. A lot of different people taking blame for it um, mm-hmm. because that's just kind of the team mentality. Pete Carroll tried to say that it was his decision. Russell, I've heard Russell Wilson say that it was his decision. I've heard. I don't think, I, I just think as a team, they yeah. didn't want to let any one person out to dry. So it was easier for them and they felt better. Indivi- like multiple of them taking responsibility. Yeah, I mean, that way it couldn't be put on, put on any one person. I think it's better if they do take it as a team, because in that moment when you're at the doorstep and you need to make a decision, what do you do? You would much rather go down unified as a team in the fact that, hey, we're, we're going to throw the ball. We're steadfast in it. We all agree. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I would much rather go down that way than like, say, Pete Carroll saying, oh, yeah, we wanted to throw the ball. But Russell Wilson going, why didn't we run it? I think it was much easier being unified as a team. Absolutely. It was easier to move on as a franchise, like with the fan base as well. Cause can you imagine how hard it would have been for the fan base to forgive whatever one person, if they would have just kind of let laid, laid that person out to dry. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, let's, let's look at what happened after that though, because obviously, I mean, they still had that, that incredible team, but like the first one to go was Sherman. Correct. And that was due to his injury. Well, so if you want to go deeper, there was obviously the big three, really. Uh, and actually, there you could have a couple different big threes. But basically, it comes down to Earl Thomas, Cam Chancellor, and Richard Sherman. Bobby Wagner in there, too. Um, if we're talking strictly Legion of Boom, yeah, that was mostly yeah, that, that secondary. Boom so. Was the secondary between secondary. Richard Sherman, Byron Maxwell, Earl Thomas. Brandon and- Browner was somewhere in there, too, right? He, hmm. wasn't on the, he was on the Super Bowl team. He was not on the second Super Bowl team. Gotcha. I believe. Um, basically, the first one to go was Byron Maxwell. Uh, he left after that, um, the second Super Bowl. That's right. Yeah. I, I he left thought. to go to Philadelphia. And Cam Chancellor started the year off on a holdout. There were some tensions there. Um, and honestly, from that point on, if we're being honest, they did not receive quality play from Cam Chancellor and arguably Richard Sherman. Richard Sherman did his job. But he was definitely playing. He, he was he was no longer that top of the league yeah. lockdown corner. Well, and I, give, give him credit though. Give him credit. He's gotten himself back into oh, yeah, into that conversation. You can see in Richard Sherman's stats. He was a first team All Pro from 2012 to 2014. Never made the first team All Pro again, even though he mm-hmm. went back to the Pro Bowl several times. Mm-hmm. But he was no longer viewed as the shutdown corner, one of yeah. the top in the game. Cam and Chancellor you talk- never had another good uh, – he actually – I remember he had a, he had really one notable play, and that was keeping Calvin Johnson from scoring in uh, that next regular season. But he was definitely plagued from injuries, and that's what led him to yeah. retire early. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you talked about you did receive, like, great top-of-the-line play from him. A big part of that was really his injuries. Yeah. And, I mean, in some ways you can't really blame the dude. I mean, if your body just starts giving out on you, and that just – it forced him into early retirement. There wasn't a whole lot he could do about it. So um, – So with all these guys leaving, looking back, they have not made it to the conference championship of the playoffs since 2014. So I just want to ask why, why couldn't they get back? So the way that I see it, a lot of things happened with the defense, right? You lost a lot of guys and guys that we haven't even mentioned, like Michael Bennett, Cliff Averill, um, even in seasons uh, further from then, you lost Frank Clark, who was a great piece for them in 2018. They, they just have a really hard time keeping guys on defense. Even now, they've been able to retain Bobby Wagner, but K.J. Wright is a free agent this year, and he's most likely not going to resign with them. I would say two big moves um, kind of have kept the Seahawks back in these past few years. One of them was the initial Max Unger trade to the Saints when they got Jimmy Graham in return. I mean, Jimmy at the time, Jimmy. it seemed like a fantastic move. Jimmy Graham. It seemed like it would help them on offense was significantly, one of the best but he just never panned ball. out. Yeah. He never panned out under Wilson. He 100% just... never panned out. Jimmy yeah. Graham was never that good again. No. Um, and, Tim, you had mentioned about uh, Drew Brees and his ability to 
heightened tight end. Drew Brees play. has always shown throughout his career and career and like a lot of people don't know, but this is even pushing back to to his days at Purdue. Um, fun fact with about Drew Brees really quickly is he had a a tight end back at at Purdue. Don't remember his name. Part of the reason why, kind of a nobody. Drew Brees was so good at u- utilizing his tight ends. He turned that tight end into an All American that year. He got some tryouts with some teams. Never even got drafted because he was he was a big guy. He had good hands. He wasn't that fast. Wasn't that athletic. But Drew Brees put it where he could go it, where he could catch it, and he got it. Um, so Drew Brees has always had had that that ability, and it showed with his his relationship with Jimmy Graham. So it made Jimmy Graham's value so much higher for going other places, and that's why Seahawks gave up Max Hunger. But they never that got that kind of production out of him because I mean Wilson's shown he knows how to use his tight ends, but at the same time that's never been his strong point. He's never had like that breakout tight end or had a tight end that's done that like particularly well. He's also, always had like Wilson doesn't specifically. They also kind of rotate tight ends, better. especially recently. Yeah, no, Russell Wilson does a great job of just as a good leader should making everybody better. Having yeah, Russell yeah. Wilson he doesn't focus on, on one position really, and having him on the consistently like he hasn't been hurt, having him on the field consistently, his such health a has huge been insane. Bonus. And that stability at the quarterback position has been huge for the Seahawks. Having the rest Russell of it just hasn't really such been a there. blessing. Um, and then going back that second big move that happened that really kind of messed things up was losing um, Dan Quinn as your defensive coordinator uh, and him going to the Falcons. When you lose a defensive coordinator so many times throughout the history of the NFL, have we seen offenses and defensive fall apart when they lose that person? We look at the bears of 2018. Vic Fangio, I was going to say, because they still have all the talent yeah. and yeah, they're still pretty darn good, but they don't have that same firepower that they had yeah. under Fangio. It, it makes uh, it takes the right person to draw up a scheme and utilize the players to really bring out their full potential. Like, like we mentioned, Dan Quinn with the Seahawks, uh, Vic Fangio with the Bears. There are tons of examples of it, but it takes that right person to truly bring out what that team has inside of them. Sometimes literally all it is is just that coach, it may not even be necessarily the scheme. It's, it's understanding your guys. And now, yes, your scheme absolutely has a lot to do with that. But sometimes it even just, just comes with how are you able to motivate your players? As a coach, sometimes you have to know how to get your players to come with that, that extra edge. Um, and with a coordinator, you're focusing on you've got your guys. Head coach, you've got, you're like, you're, you've got your entire team, but a coordinator's got your set amount of guys. This is your – it's almost like kind of coaching like, – kind of like coaching a high school team again. You've got this, this certain group that they're, they're your guys, and if you have their back, then they're going to have your back. Um, and when you can create really special bonds, there, that's what creates those really special sides of the ball. And I think that Legion of Boom defense had that because, yeah, they had those they had great secondary, but they also had some great role players all around. You talk about the guys that they've lost since then. Um, and I think they just knew how to get exactly what they needed. It may not have, they may not have all been the best at everything, but they knew how to get what they needed out of every single one of those guys. And that's what made them so dynamic. Um, I think like you were saying, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, you take a look at the initial draft that kind of crafted the Legion of Boom, 2011, 2012, and 2010 for Earl Thomas. Just some of the best drafts that we've ever seen out of, uh, out of a team con- uh, in consecutive years. Uh, 2011, they draft K.J. Wright, Richard Sherman, Byron Maxwell, and Malcolm Smith all in the same draft. And then the next year, you get Bruce Irvin, Bobby Wagner, and Russell Wilson. And it's just crazy how how they created they they almost created a team out of those two drafts. Yes, and then plain how and simple, it fell apart. Um, yeah. Well, quite and, frankly, what, what's notable out of those drafts is how many players were not first rounders. Exactly. Like, I mean, for example, Richard Sherman, he was a fifth rounder. Byron Maxwell was a sixth rounder. Cam Chancellor was a fifth rounder. Like I could go. Malcolm Smith was a seventh rounder. How many gems they found? in their late rounds is really a testament to that front office and something that was really key to them essentially in two seasons, 2010 scraping into the playoffs at seven and nine. And then three years later, they won the Super Bowl. That is a fast turnaround. It's 
it's an insane turnaround. And, th- and that shows sure. you the power. It shows you the power of a good draft. And that's why having a good front office is so important because it can help you turn around a team so fast when you're able to find those diamonds in the rough. I mean, for instance, it's, they haven't been able to have crazy success, but look at what the one pick of Dak Prescott did to the Cowboys. They found their franchise quarterback just by ha- just by finding that one diamond in the rough for them. And that's made all the difference for their team. And when they don't have them, it shows. They're back to the team that they were before. Even yeah. with the talent that they have around there, that that key position for them is it was so important. And that's what the Seahawks were able to do. They were able to find diamonds in the rough across the board. They did it better than anyone else at the time. Yeah, so... Yeah. No? Uh, uh, basically... I was just going to say that those two big moves that I had talked about are basically what you can see in the Seahawks today. I mean, Russell Wilson quite literally has gotten his title as a magician due to the Seahawks inability to craft a functioning offensive line. They literally have not had a good offensive line. I don't think they've had an offensive line that placed in the top 16 of the NFL since that Super Bowl. Uh, And even the defense, I mean, they've had stars consistently, but not not a I complete mean, unit that they could put together. They always unit. they've always had holes in certain aspects of it, and teams will find ways to exploit that. Well, Real top of the line defenses think, can't have that that kind of uh, that kind of leverage. I mean, you would think with a quarterback like Russell Wilson, your number one priority would be protecting him, because if you yeah. don't, we see how that can go very very wrong. Example Joe Burrow's example, first season. Yeah. Example A is Joe Burrow's first season. Example B from that 2012 draft class, Andrew Luck. The Colts didn't get him an offensive line for years, and they killed him. That could have just yeah, as they, they literally single-handedly that retired have, him. That could have just as easily been Seattle with Russell Wilson. But I will say, though, that's, that's one of the things that's Wilson absolutely for being able to be durable all of those years. Exactly. Really stay I was going to say that magician and be the franchise that Seattle needs him to be. Yeah, because like that's that is one hell of a testament to him because he quite literally I mean, he's he's taken his fair share of hits, whether it be because he's shown that he absolutely can scramble as well when need when needed. And he's quite good at finding those, those gaps. He's taken hits out on the run in the pocket, you name it, he's taken it. Um, so for him to be able to, to every single time, just bounce back up and, and still be that same guy. I mean, has he even, when was, I can't even remember. There's some crazy stat. I think that he hasn't missed like a game in, I don't even know how many seasons he might not have missed a start in his career. I don't believe he's ever missed. I don't think he's missed a start in his career. Yeah, no, Russell, Wilson, that is, Russell Wilson has never missed a start. Never. And that's insane for as many years. Now, granted, that's he's like, not like that's a like 15 Farvish. year veteran or whatever. That's like Farvish. But, I mean, yeah, like, exactly. That's like a good kind of Farvish, not like <laughs> the bad interception Farvish. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and one of the Farvish. things. And it's it, it's going to show what what taking care of your body the right way can do, um, and he's he's talked he's come out multiple times and talked about how much money he spends to keep himself in that position. One hundred. Um, but he he he's been a he's been a huge reason why they've been able to stay relevant. And we pointed out um, talking earlier that uh, they've only had one uh, season under ten wins even since that 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 Super Bowl and then the loss it's of the 2012. Super Bowl. After. So despite them not. Yeah, since despite them not having that that dynasty sense of being able to get to those Super Bowls, they still haven't had bad seasons. He's been able to drag whatever kind of team he's had, whether it be a pretty decent one or mm-hmm. a pretty incomplete one. He's been able to drag them to great records consistently. So, Tim, that leads me to say, like, with all of that being said, the Seahawks have always been good, but they truly were the dynasty that never was. So with all that they being so said, much potential. what is what is the legacy that this Seahawks team has left throughout the years? What do you think like their overall defining legacy would be? Well, well you want to take this one first? Yeah. Um, I think when you think of it uh, as it, from an overall, you definitely remember those three faces on the defense. Um, everyone's always going to remember the Legion of Boom. Right. They got their Super Bowl ring. They got their two Super Bowl appearances. And you have some definitely iconic moments. Um, Sorry, receiver like Crabtree. (laughs) Um, Lots of trash talking from Richard Sherman. And actually, 
that's another thing that's kind of left a stain on their legacy is that, um, what's the word? Um, that tension in the team, because not only was Richard Sherman very vocal to other teams and other players, many times throughout the, uh, throughout the years, which kind of went unnoticed by the media and, and the fans, Richard Sherman was not a fan of how Pete Carroll treated Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson has always been Pete Carroll's take him under his wing, protect him at all costs. Richard Sherman, I remember at one practice, picked off Russell Wilson and uh, screamed, you effing suck. Um, and He's ever a competitor. Since day, Russell Wilson did not have the same relationship with Richard Sherman. Even Earl Thomas being carted off the field and flipping off the Seahawks bench. Uh, a lot of tension has been left behind from that Seahawks team. Hmm. Um, but I think but, the one, the one thing you like a couple things that you do take away from that Legion of Boom team, no, like you said, the defense and how fun that defense was to watch because they were a fantastic turnover defense and they would fly around that secondary would fly around Cam Chancellor and Earl Thomas would hit guys. Richard Sherman would deflect passes out of the air, intercept balls, run it back to the house and then talk trash to the quarterback while he did it. And no matter what it was, you really can't tell the history of the NFL in the early 2010s without the Legion of Boom. You, it is, you cannot leave them out. Exactly. I mean, to me, when I think about like the legacy of what the Legion of Boom left behind, it, it comes down to, to a couple of things. And first one for, for me is, they, they they brought back a resurgence of of making of making a statement of how important defense was to the game of football. They brought back defense in in a in, in a large part to the NFL, um, and not only defense as a whole and being a strong defense, but being a playmaking defense, one that can make a difference to help your offense, not just stop the defense or stop the offense and hold them to. To, to certain things, but being able to put your offense in better situations, being able to, to help uh, the other side of the ball. And I think that's one of the things that they, they really left a lasting impact on the game. Um, and when you think top defenses of all time, you're, you're going to be thinking about them to, for years to come um, and largely due to, to that playmaking ability and, and some of the highlights that came from it. Um, you're always going to remember guys like Cam Chancellor and the what ifs of if injuries hadn't plagued his career, um, and, and guys like Earl Thomas and, and Richard Sherman, which also had their, the, the course of, of their um, careers altered by injuries and, and whatnot throughout the team. Um, so, so yes, no, you, you do talk about the, the fact that that tension did kind of plague them. But I think l- largely overall, as time goes on, a lot of people are going to remember those positives from that team because they were a really, really fun team to watch. And, and that's what people are going to be talking about for years to come. Yeah, the Legion of Boom and that Seahawks team was truly the dynasty that never was. And that'll do it for today's episode. This is going to be the start of a new series, The Dynasty That Never Was, where you look at different teams. Um, if you guys want to see more of this, drop a like, drop a comment. Uh, we have other let videos. Us know, let us know who you think that Let us uh, know we if cover. there are any other dynasties that never was that you want us to cover. Now, we have a bunch of other stuff on the channel. We just did a video on what's wrong with the Chicago Bears. We have a bunch of NFL draft content, which we will be continuing up until the night of the draft, which is coming very, very soon. So stay tuned for all that. But until next time, like, subscribe, and we out.